think conversations with people we don't agree with is the way we work out what we really think about things. Um, essentially, we need to be open to being persuaded. We need to be open to compromise. We need to be open to a sense that there are many different points of view and those points of view have validity, not always, um, but in some instances, and we may not be understanding, we may not understand why people are having these positions because we don't understand the instances that, they, that they're using these positions uh, and from, from where those positions derive. So I've been reading three books for which I, as I, are kind of outside my comfort zone in the sense that I, I'm not sure, I mean, two, I profoundly disagree with, and one, I'm not sure what the, what the result of, of the thinking is. Um, but in the end, all of them share, I think, one similar position, which is, or, or tries to define the nature of self and free will. Um, and I'm someone who uh, intuitively believes we are individual selves, that we cohere as a point of view that is both located and um, continuous. Some people don't believe that. Some people think we are merely a sort of concatenation of perceptions that only appear to cohere to us and combine as us as an individual. Um, and at the moment, that's probably more fashionable, but that doesn't make it right. So what have I got? So I'm reading um, from, back to, uh, from Bacteria to Bark and Back by Daniel C. Dennett, who is the kind of world's leading philosopher, neurophilosopher. And he makes up one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse of neo-atheism, or new atheism rather, and neo-Darwinians, Darwinianists, um, uh, Richard Dawkins, the late great Chris Hitchens, and Sam Harris. But he's probably the kind of grandfather, he's the oldest, he's probably the most credible, I would think. Um, but his view, ultimately, uh, and it's much more nuanced than this, but then you have to read the book, is, is a kind of computational theory of mind, which is that actually our minds or our brains are essentially like computers. He's a kind of wholly deterministic philosopher who essentially believes that we are determined by physical stimulus that we receive that has a physical impact on us and it creates certain uh, behaviours um, in a, a really kind of simple way. Um, and I think he has said this somewhere, but it's obviously a much more reduced, um, uh, a reductionist version of his uh, philosophy is that we are just superly, super complex thermometers. Um, the point about the computational theory of mind or any kind of similar metaphors, which have been brilliantly um, demolished by Rowan Williams in his uh, What is Consciousness lecture, which is on YouTube, is that obviously computers um, don't do anything that haven't been um, created by some external force. They are complicated tools. Tools don't do anything. We do things with tools. We create tools, and we do things with tools. Now that suggests, and I don't really want to get into this, that you can't have a you can't have a computational theory of mind without some kind of external agency creating the computer and, and giving it its 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 way of working. Um, now it will be true to say that all the three authors uh, and philosophers that I'm talking about now uh, talking about today are atheists, and I'm not. I'm a theist, um, but I don't align myself to any particular religion. Um, uh, I just don't believe that, that, that atheism answers our questions, um, although I am probably culturally a Christian because I'm an Anglo-Saxon Celt in the UK in Western Europe. Um, so that's just my broad opinion, my broad position. Um, but for, for me, Dennett, who is, is a great writer and very convincing and persuasive, seems to me always to occasionally is just a little bit slick when he essentially starts going, we don't know, but it's probably this. No, it's definitely this. And that's my issue is if, if, if we don't know, let's not be definite about it. Um, and there are certain things in evolution that we don't know, 
but he seems to have an agenda. He seems to be essentially saying, I'm, I'm going to press this point as though it's certain. Um, the next book is, well, it's actually not this book, but I can't find Straw Dogs somewhere in the house. I lose books all the time. But it's John Gray, who is a, an emeritus professor of European thought at the uh, London School of Economics, Harvard, Oxford. Very eminent, very learned, very brilliant, very personable in his books. But he essentially says in Straw Dogs that man is just a brutal, rapacious um, animal that has no real sense of rational responsibility in terms of ultimate goodness. There is no meaning behind man. We are purposeless, rapacious animals. It's a super um, clear view of us as um uh, quite a lot less than human um, uh, at our at our core. Um, the world would give ample evidence for this. How the what we conduct ourselves in the world, um, but I think that is to err uh, towards the pessimistic. Um, and you know, and and what and I wonder whether you know if we were to if if somehow we were to to understand to collate all the combined acts of man whether in fact it would tilt to the negative and not tilt to the positive sorry the sun's coming in slightly there's not much i can do about that um now finally um we have the brilliant behave by robert sapolsky the biology of our of humans that are worst best and worst which is a extraordinary compendium of, of uh, ex scientific and behavioural economic and neurological experiments of the last 50 years, essentially trying to unpack how it is we are who we are. And it is incredibly, it feels a kind of agenda-free in the sense that he looks at neurobiology, he looks at the endocrine system, he looks at behavioural economic um, uh, experiments. So he he he's looking from the the sort of us on our kind of micro level through to our kind of broader behaviour, um, and he doesn't come down on any one. You know, he doesn't kind of go, oh, and it's all the selfish gene, or oh, it's all nurture and how good our parents were to us. He basically says we're this extraordinary complex concatenation of activity that behavior from which behavior kind of emanates now what's interesting i mean he he self-identifies as an atheist what's important about this is is that he provides unlike the other two he provides an incredibly complex picture of us and our behaviors um which to in the same sense oh no no in a, in a different sense or of course in a different sense um pushes the idea of self away because because you can't reduce it to any single thing and it just we can it, it's we would define self by our behavior which may be this extraordinary complex area but to kind of locate self i think is he would see it as as foolish i think he errs on the side of nurture over nature um he's very good I'm talking about the evolutionary development of the prefrontal cortex which happens in puberty through to our 20s as as the last in our evolutionary stage of our brain kind of in individuals which make takes it as far away from our kind of genetic inheritance as possible it's, kind, it's basically kind of going okay genetics is going to do all this and now we're going to get involved and now we're going to help you make rational decisions um, or smart decisions um, and not just be, um, uh, you know, propelled by our selfish genes or whatever. So that all of those things, um, they're all great. Um, uh, some of it's slightly beyond me. Um, uh, some of it I radically disagree with. What none of them mention is an experiment, which I think is important in terms of self and free will, is an experiment that was done about 20 years ago that's both been supported and... Um, disproved but it kind of goes something like this you're in we're in a brain scanner and we are asked to make certain decisions but we're also asked to um and but those certain decisions are we have to identify when we make the decisions and the brain scanner essentially 
will um, pick up on you know the ex um, the excitation or blood flow increased blood flow of our brains in certain areas which will indicate when we make the decisions and what was discovered was that uh, our decision making um, happened not microseconds before we were conscious of it but sometimes up to 10 seconds before we were conscious of making a decision the decision had been made which to some people essentially said um, if we're not conscious of our decisions um, we don't have any free will because essentially our brain is making decisions and we are becoming conscious of it and it is an illusion that we have made the decision the decision has happened before we are conscious of it um, uh, and that's quite compelling but does it follow that because we are not conscious of our decision making that it is not a self making that decision now there is an argument which is part to do with this that that, that we may be um, predominantly determined that we are we subconsciously or unconsciously make a lot of decisions but that the self or the conscious mind can decide against them so we don't have free will but we have free won't um, which I have some sympathy with because um, I I don't think we can say we are completely indeterminate but I want to offer another version which is that our that if we think about the amount of stimulus that we receive and the amount of decisions we have to make in every single second of our day much is automated now it's automated because otherwise we'd be so overwhelmed we couldn't do anything because we have to go what do I do now 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 what am I seeing I'm seeing red blue blah blah this that 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 you know to be conscious would be to be to be 100 percent conscious would be to be completely overwhelmed so we park or move or automate over our lives certain decision making but because we do that that doesn't necessarily mean that it is not ourself having made choices which to park or move or automate so i want to posit this view that the that much of our automated or unconscious um, decision making is what i would call a kind of self-will that we are just not conscious of so it, it is it is broadly speaking the self now the reason that appeals to me is because I'm I intuitively believe in the self I, I I see myself as a located cohered human being that exists over time now that might not seem very radical but many people think that isn't the case many people think we are just a sort of extraordinarily complex fragment um, sense of kind of fragmentary impulses that give the illusion of of continuity and coherence um, and our intuitive our intuitive sense of coherence is in fact an illusion the point is 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 just because it's intuitive doesn't mean it's not the case and I think the lived experience is um, is evidence of that now what's interesting is 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 I might give the neuro um, materialist this idea that you, I can see that physical properties might be able to, to um, hold memories I will give it to the neurobiologists that feelings of regret might be um, part of our um, uh, biological um, kind of uh, our, our system but I'm going to throw in one thing which I think I've read before so it's not my thought is I'm not sure how it describes nostalgia how is nostalgia contained or embodied in material maybe it is I don't know but it's it's but nostalgia seems to me to be so principally about the self's experience a while back that it almost suggests you know it, it gives us this idea of um, continuity and coherence and with that I will leave you to your Sundays thank you very much